forced wages down. In slack periods, thousands were simply laid off. Social and economic conditions were hard. Today, in the East End of London, there are other cultural and religious minorities. But at the turn of the century, immigrant Russian Jews were just laying the foundation of their workers' movement. This proved difficult for several reasons. Most Jewish artisans worked in small, closely-knit workshops, which were difficult to unionize. What is more, many of them yearned to leave the working proletariat, to become self-employed, independent, this individualism was reflected at the top levels of the Jewish socialist movement, too. Jewish leaders quarreled among themselves about the appropriate political direction of their movement. Consider the difficulties. Each new wave of immigration brought in more cheap labor, more potential strike breakers. This seemingly endless flow of immigrants gave rise to yet another problem. These aliens were viewed with apprehension and suspicion by English society, including some members of the Jewish establishment. Opposition to the flow of immigrants culminated in 1905 in the first Aliens Act of Great Britain, intended to restrict the arrival of Jews. Despite these problems, Jewish working class militancy had some dramatic successes. In 1899, 10,000 Jewish tailors in London struck for a month, demanding a 12-hour day and union rates. Their strike succeeded, partly because of the backing they received from some English trades unions. But there was also another factor. In a climate of rising anti-alien feeling, some members of the largely ambivalent Anglo-Jewish establishment now gave their immigrant brethren greater support. However, Jewish activism was spectacular rather than consistent, and the gains won were soon lost. There was a plethora of small and active trades unions and cultural societies, but their membership was dwindling. Faced with this decline, many socialist leaders left London in despair and headed for new pastures in America. There too, Jewish society was shaken by the arrival of new immigrants. This is how Harper's Weekly depicted New York Jews in Central Park in 1872. Ten years later, things had changed radically. The Russian Jews had by now poured into the tenements and workshops of the Lower East Side. These were the social conditions that would favor the sort of mass organization which social democrats from Russia wanted to create. By 1890, there were nearly 30 Jewish unions and socialist groups on the Lower East Side. The word was spread by newspaper editors like Abe Kahan, a former Talmudic student and revolutionary from Russia, who established a socialist paper in Yiddish, the Arbeiter Zeitung. In New York, Marxist socialist ideas took firm root. But as the movement in America grew, it too was riven by ideological disputes. Socialists like Kahan envisaged Jewish socialism as part of the wider struggle for world socialism. Trades unions and the Socialist Party, he believed, were a route into American working life, a form of assimilation. Others saw Yiddish as the key to preserving Jewish identity in America. They fought for a Jewish labor movement that would defend strictly Jewish priorities. But then, in 1903, a traumatic pogrom in Kishinev, back in Russia, triggered a new flood of emigration to America. This aggravated conditions of life and work. However, these newcomers helped to remold Jewish socialism in the United States. It inclined more to Yiddish culture and Jewish issues than ever before. But their radicalism was in no way diminished. During a three-year period between 1909 and 1912, American Jewish workers became involved in a series of industrial actions which later became known as the Great Revolt. The pant makers, the waist makers, and 70,000 cloak makers struck at various times. 
The demands, anxieties and conditions of work are clearly mirrored in the pages of a worker's newspaper of the time. And during 1912, it was estimated that 175,000 Jewish workers took strike action in the battle for higher wages, shorter hours and better conditions. These were vicious industrial wars in which employers and unions hired thugs and gangsters, the employers to break up picket lines, the unions to smash non-union workshops. By the First World War, the Jewish unions had become a permanent, powerful fixture in Jewish working life. Jewish socialists had created a chain of welfare organizations and cultural bodies. Among these were the Workers' Circle and a vibrant Yiddish press. All this was part of a diverse and increasingly rich Yiddish-American-Jewish culture. The Yiddish socialist daily, Vorwärts, had a circulation of 150,000. Reading this newspaper, Russian Jews, now settled in America, could follow the progress of the Jewish socialist movement, not only in Der Heim, but also in Palestine. Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, had always been a focus for the national feelings of Jews. But according to tradition, a return to the Holy Land would come about only after the arrival of the Messiah. However, modern Jewish nationalism, deeply influenced by Western European thought, was to challenge these beliefs. This, combined with oppressive conditions in Russia, made a return to the land now seem an urgent and immediate possibility, even for some religious leaders like Rabbi Joseph Schwartz, who drew this map in the mid-19th century. It was at this very time that the Middle East, and particularly Palestine, became the focus of European interest and political ambition. European artists, like David Roberts, came back with paintings and photographs of an exotic Orient which was heavily romanticized. Mark Twain, among others, was more realistic. Under the Turks, he said, Palestine had become depopulated, its glorious past utterly forgotten. Palestine is a desolate country whose soil is rich enough, but is given over entirely to weeds a silent, mournful expanse. Of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. The hills are barren, the valleys are unsightly deserts. It is a hopeless, dreary, heartbroken land. Palestine is sacred to poetry and tradition, but it is a dreamland. It was with a dream of their own that the first Jewish pioneers arrived in Palestine in the early 1880s. They had little money, know-how or resources of any kind, but they established a number of small settlements. These pioneers faced the multiple onslaughts of malaria, extraordinarily hard physical conditions and their despair of ever completing the task they had set themselves of building a society from scratch. By the turn of the century, the enterprise was on the brink of collapse. New idealism was infused into the Jewish settlements by the second wave of emigration from Russia, the second Aliyah, which followed the pogrom in Kishinev in 1903 and the turmoil accompanying the revolution of 1905. The second Aliyah was characterized by a radical new ideology, socialist Zionism. Socialist Zionists argued that centuries of Jewish history had now to be reversed. They had to break stereotypes of the Jew as being an urban, non-productive, rootless member of society and present instead a new Jew. Muscular Judaism, as it was called, self-consciously depicted a Jew who stood in marked contrast to the old stereotype. Straight-backed, muscular, clean-shaven, working the land. In photograph after photograph, the pioneering socialist Zionists created highly romantic images of themselves. They cleared swamps, built roads, planted crops, and created the basis for a working class Jewish state. It was this determination to create a total Jewish society, particularly to stress that Jews could be agricultural laborers, 
that provided the innovative basis for the growth of Jewish economic life in Palestine. The kibbutz was conceived as the ideal way of combining socialism with constructive work, a unique idea of collective settlement. The first socialist settlement was founded at Tagania in 1909. It was successful and a range of experiments in collective farming and cooperatives followed, rejuvenating and expanding the Jewish presence in Palestine. The philosophy of socialist Zionism was pioneered by Nachman Sirkin, it was in 1896 that Theodor Herzl had published his epoch-making work, The Jewish State. Two years later, Sirkin wrote his own blueprint, The Socialist Jewish State. By 1914, the socialist Zionist pioneers had carved out the basis of a sound agricultural economy in Palestine. They had set up labor unions, socialist parties, newspapers and journals, a flourishing Hebrew culture. The national revival in socialist form had become, for them, a reality. It was no longer merely a subject for abstract argument in the coffee houses of the Lower East Side. Socialism had by now emerged as one of the most significant influences within the Zionist movement. Socialism had barely been mentioned at the first Zionist Congress in 1897, but only 20 years later, institutions were being set up that would give national shape to the Jewish settlement in Palestine and later to the State of Israel. These foundations were laid by socialists of the Second Aliyah. Back in Russia, most Jewish socialists did not accept the Zionist remedy. For the Bund, Jewish socialism belonged in the diaspora. So for them did Jewish nationalism, and in 1901, Partly in response to the challenge from Zionism, the Bund demanded national autonomy for the Jews within Russia. For international socialists, this was a heresy. As one of them jibed, the Bundists are Zionists who suffer from seasickness. The rift between the Bund and the internationalists widened. At the Russian Social Democrats Congress in 1903, Lenin and the prominent Jewish revolutionary leader Trotsky themselves led the opposition to the Bund. The Bundist leaders walked out in disgust, a dramatic gesture with far-reaching consequences. And so, for the next three years, the Bund operated as a separate party within Russia, and to quite remarkable effect. During the revolution of 1905, which almost toppled the Tsar, Bundists fought on the barricades in Vilna and Riga, side by side with Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. When the government resorted to the familiar tactic of encouraging pogroms, Bundists and socialist Zionists formed defense groups to protect the Jewish quarters. This is the Bundist fighting division in the district of Pinsk in 1905. After these heroic efforts, Jewish socialists attained a new popularity. The Jewish people saw them as their protector. The revolution of 1905 was the Bund's high point in Russia. It was severely damaged in the fighting and by the repression that followed. Only in independent Poland after the First World War did the original Russian Bundism truly survive and flourish. But Bundism, as we have seen, had been exported. In other countries, the Bund had become a fixture of Jewish life, an expression of Yiddish culture, a voice of the Jewish masses. Jewish socialist parties invested huge effort in cultural and political programs, yet in the years following the First World War, generally speaking, they began to decline. Only in the national settlement in Palestine had Jewish socialism become sufficiently institutionalized to blossom. So was Jewish socialism only a superficial occurrence in Jewish history? Was it a one-generation phenomenon? rooted in the experience of upheaval and migration. The children of many immigrants did become professionals, shopkeepers and academics, but it was not for this reason that the movement began to fade away. The Russian Revolution of 1917 paradoxically dealt it a blow. The communist victory divided Jewish socialists into hostile camps. Some joined the communists and advocated assimilation. Others stuck to the nationalist line, 
in the Bund and in the Zionist movement. Jewish socialists outside Russia became prey to the Red Scare that broke out in the West in response to the revolution. In America and England, leaders and some rank-and-file socialists were deported.